so speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Matthew chapter 9, this is a great chapter where we see several examples of Jesus answering prayers. He's hearing the petition of those that are suffering, and uh, some of these people have been going through a difficult time for years and years, and I mean, they're probably at their end. They don't know what to do. They need help. And when they see Jesus, they cry unto Him, and Jesus answers the prayers of the people. He hears them. He answers. He gives them what they need. And I love Matthew chapter 9. There's several things we'll look at this morning. Uh, start in verse number 28, at the end there, near, near the end, verse number 28. And when He was coming to the house, the blind men came unto Him, and Jesus saith unto him, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. Notice he says, Believe ye. He's saying, Do you believe I'm able to give you your sight? Two blind men working together follow Jesus into a house. They ask for relief. They ask for healing. And he says, Do you believe I'm able to do this? They say, Yea, Lord. Their answer is yes, of course. Yeah, I, I hear you. And they were healed by their own faith. Look, he says, Believe ye that I am able to do this. And his answer, According to your faith, be it unto you. According to your faith, be it unto you. What if they didn't believe? What if they didn't trust that God was hearing their prayer? What if they didn't trust that uh, deliverance, salvation, a miracle, what if they didn't trust that that was even possible? Then they would not have been healed. They would not have received deliverance at the hand of God. And what we're going to talk about is the importance of your personal faith. Uh, it's your personal faith in the Lord that saves you. It's your choice to choose to trust in the Lord for salvation. And it is your own faith in God as you walk through the Christian life that helps you get through difficult times. Yeah. It's your own confidence when life seems to go down that, get, that keeps you through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. When you're going through that valley, that low time in your life, that's when your confidence in God should be just as strong as it is when you're on the top of the mountain. It's very important to remember that we must trust God and choose to have faith and believe that He's bringing us through things for a reason when it's up or when it's down. It's our own faith. It's our personal choices that God wants to see. He wants to see us grow in that. And so we'll be talking about the importance of our personal faith in the Lord and how He wants to answer our prayers. But if we're not praying then how can He answer those prayers? If we're not asking, if we're not believing, how can we receive? And I want you to understand, in God's eyes, there is great value to your personal choices to obey Him, your personal choice to have faith in Him, but then also choosing to make these requests. Choosing to pray unto God, knowing that He hears you, and you say, hey, you have not because you ask not. Why am I having a rough time? Have you asked? Maybe God's trying to teach us a lesson. You say, well, why does this matter? Why is this important? What's the purpose of this sermon? Well, we go out to compel them to come into the Father's house. We persuade them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We go out, we preach the gospel. That's our choice. But we're really going out confronting people, giving them a choice, telling them that it is 100% their choice whether or not they go to heaven. God has completed everything that's necessary for an individual to be saved, but they must choose to have their own faith. What do you say? According to your faith, be it unto you. The problem is many people out there don't believe that. Mm. Others will depressingly say, well, there is nothing you can do. Fate has already determined who will be saved and who will not. Listen, that is bad doctrine. Yeah. That is a doctrine of devils. There are those that teach that God has already chosen those that will end up going to heaven. And God has already sealed the fate and chosen those that will go to hell. Now, th that is bad doctrine. Yep. To say that somebody is going to go to hell and there's nothing they can do to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you cannot ask God for mercy because God created you just to destroy you in hell. That is not the gospel. Listen, that is a curse. And there are people raising their children under that curse and they're taking away uh, the, the, the thought of a choice that they must choose who they're going to serve and they must choose whether or not they'll obey and they must choose whether they will have faith in the promises of God and that is wicked, that is bad doctrine and this one chapter debunks it in several different ways and most of you know what I'm talking about. This is the Reformed Catholic uh, Calvinism as it's often called uh, and really it's Gnostic Fatalism. It is Gnosticism and it's fatalism. Well, it doesn't matter. We can't make any choice. Listen, this is satanic doctrine. This is the doctrines of devils. A lot of this came from 
Plato, who was a pervert, and it goes on to Origen, yet another pervert that castrated himself, and then uh, Augustine commented on that. And listen, those three men are not church fathers. They are not biblical Christians. They are uh, literally, they were working for the devil to try to hijack Christianity. They deny the faith that saves your soul. They say that it's just not that they teach a different faith. They teach a different salvation. And I'm really preaching about faith versus fatalism. And I want you to understand what fatalism is. Let me just read you a textbook definition. Fatalism. The belief that all events are predetermined and therefore inevitable. Whether or not you came to church this morning, you had nothing to do with it. It wasn't your choice. God made it happen. He forced it upon you. You had zero free will in it. You had uh, zero choices to make today. Now, that is not true. That's a lie. Yes. And people try to force the sovereignty of God. And listen, sovereign means king. And they say, well, God is obviously the king, and therefore he makes you do whatever you do. Well, that's wrong and weird and bad because then, of course, they, they blame God for the evil that you do as well, for the sins of your flesh, right? Well, sovereign is king, right? Well, God is king over all of his creation, and he has given all of his creations from the angels to mankind a choice. They have the free will to choose who they will serve and what they will do. This is so important. A few uh, synonyms for fatalism is inevitability. It was inevitable that that would happen. There's nothing you could do to change it. Listen, that's not true. There's nothing like that. Other than, hey, it's inevitable that the Lord will return. It's inevitable that the Lord will judge. It's inevitable that God has future plans. You can't stop what God is doing. And meanwhile, God has given us a choice where we will spend eternity. Amen. It's 100% up to your faith, yes. your choice. You must have confidence in God. Another is foreordination. It is foreordained. You couldn't choose, right? Same concept. Determinism. It's already been determined. I don't know why you even bother, right? If you're going to win the lottery, it's because you're going to pick up a ticket and find it on the road, right? Well, I hope you're not playing the lottery, right? If you're going to get a speeding ticket this afternoon, well, it's already been determined before God created the world. He decided that <laughs> it's our choices. We reap yeah. what we sow. If you're speeding and you get a ticket, it's your fault. If you get away with it, maybe God blesses you. I believe God uses speeding tickets and red lights, red lights sometimes to prevent us from death. I do believe that. I believe God has used red lights in my life to prevent me from death. My wife got a ticket recently, a little while back, and it was a pretty hefty one. And, and uh, all I could say was, well, praise the Lord, you're safe. I mean... It's, it's a terrible thing, but, you know, it, it does go back to it was her choice. She chose to speed. The cop chose to uphold the law and give her a ticket, and it is what it is. And it's not that it was predetermined or predestined. There's another synonym. Predestination. It was already determined. It was already destined. Nothing could change it. Nothing could fix it. You had no say in it. Uh, you, like a robot, were controlled by the puppet master, and you were forced to do something against your will. No, God gives you your will. You can't even think for yourself. Listen, that's just strange doctrine. It ought to go, it ought to rub you wrong if you're a born again, Bible believing Christian. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you to help lead you and guide you and help, help you make the right choices. And when you make the wrong choice, you are choosing to grieve the Holy Spirit. These are choices that we have to pay for. Yeah. Listen, fatalism is a doctrine of devils. Uh -huh. It teaches that we can't ask for God's mercy. You can't call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, as the Bible says. You can't ask God for help or for mercy. It's already predetermined. God already decided whether or not He'll give it to you. Listen, that's wrong. That's bad. There are a lot of people caught up in this strange doctrine, and it's important for us to tell them the truth of the Scriptures. It is your choice. You must decide. You must choose to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can't just give it lip service and say, well, I read the book and I know what it says and, and I, whatever it says. No, you have to choose. You have to believe it. You have to just decide to settle it in your own heart. What is the truth? What do you say here? According to your faith, be it unto you. Not fatalism, not Calvinism, not predestinationalism. According to your faith, be it unto you. You say, well, I'm going through something in life and I'm having issues and I need God's help. Well, according to your faith, be it unto you. Are you asking? What do you say? Ask, seek, knock. Yep. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And if you're not knocking, you can't say, well, I don't know why it didn't open up. Are you knocking? 
with confidence, choosing to believe that God hears your knock. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Our choices are so important. I hate this doctrine. Yeah. I really do. I hate, I hate the doctrine. When, when you raise children in this type of doctrine and you say, well, God may have picked you to go to heaven because I know He picked me. I sure am special. I'm an ascended master. Listen, this is mysticism. This is an occult doctrine that's been wrapped with a Christian wrapper. It's very deceptive. They call it the doctrines of grace. And well, I've seen so many Calvinist families where you're raising children and they're teenagers and their flesh and their hormones go wild and they're thinking all these things and imagine going to them and saying well if you feel that way then maybe you're already destined for hell and there's nothing you can do about it what a curse to put on a child yeah. oh you know your older sister your older brother well they went out into the world therefore they're not of us and they can never come back God has already predetermined that they will burn in hell forever they had no hope for salvation what a wicked and strange doctrine Think about how odd and perverse that is. Think about how it ruins children. Calvinism ruins children. It really does. So what do we do? Well, John 15, he says, Herein is my Father glorified. Think about this. Do you want to glorify God? We pray for that in this service, don't we? We ask to the Lord, everything that we do would be to glorify you. That's my prayer. Lord, please fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to glorify you. I don't want the glory. I don't want to give you the glory. I want God to get the glory for whatever we're able to do, right? Well, how do we glorify God? He says, herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. We have to choose to glorify God by preaching the gospel, by choosing discipleship, by becoming disciplined in our life and changing our priorities, changing our perspective. Dad, it's your job to go out and get somebody saved. Mom, it's your job to raise the next generation and bear much fruit and say, hey, I'm glorifying God in my children. I'm glorifying God at work when I tell somebody what Jesus has done. That's my job. Yeah. How do we glorify God while we're here? Look, we are His servants, amen. Yeah. But we're not robots. It's our choice to die to ourself, to our own selfish will, and choose to open our mouth and boldly preach the gospel. Even when it feels awkward, even when it's not appropriate, sometimes it's necessary when the Lord is leading you and drawing you and compelling you to open your mouth and ask somebody where they're going when they die, we better do it. This is so important. That's how we glorify God when we open our mouth. You never, you never know when you're having a super co superficial conversation with someone. You're talking about the weather, you're talking about work, you're talking about a project, the news, the sports, and in your heart the Holy Spirit begins to burn and tell you, open your mouth, preach the gospel, glorify your Father, and when you do that often you'll find that that other person, although they may be talking, be talking about sports, there's something else deeper that they've been pondering. Perhaps this is something they've been praying to get settled, and there you are with the opportunity to choose to tell them that it's their choice, it's their own faith that can save their soul. God's already finished the work. Now we must enter into His rest, and He'll satisfy what's necessary for salvation. Uh, this doctrine oftentimes, the, uh, you know, the, the, the key scriptures any Calvinist would give you often deal with uh, how God has chosen you or elected you or predestined you to be conformed to the image of Son. A lot of these phrases are really do dealing with the ministry that you should have. Uh -huh. Paul was saved by his choice to believe. And God said, hey, I can use you. You've got the skills, the talents, the gifts. You've got the knowledge, the things that I need. I, and you've got the zeal. I'm going to use you in a certain way. Yeah. Amen. Other men had other gifts and talents and resources that were already given as gifts from God, right? And he said, hey, I've chosen you to a different type of ministry, to a different town of ministry, perhaps to a different individual. You think about it. Lydia, mm -hmm. she had a ministry. She had a reputation. Well, it wasn't anything like Paul's. Yeah, but she's in the Bible. She's, in the, she's better than me. I'm not in the Bible, right? She had quite the reputation of ministering to people. It's our choice. A lot of these key Calvinist scriptures, again, they really are talking about how once you're saved, once you're in Christ, in Him, then He has elected you to do a certain job, a certain ministry, for a certain purpose while you're here. Uh, and so all their verses are not really talking about God picked you for salvation and you had nothing to do with it as they want to present it. So they have to trust in their heady literature. 
these big thick books by a bunch of ca uh, Catholic fathers, Catholic bishops, and they trust in their writings and in their debates. I want to give you a couple quotes from some famous Calvinists on this topic. Charles Spurgeon. You guys know him? Yeah. You know, that Catholic bishop, right? Charles Spurgeon. I believe that nothing happens apart from divine determination and decree. We shall never be able to escape from the doctrine of divine predestination. The doctrine that God has foreordained certain people unto eternal life. Charles Spurgeon. When you see somebody that's a Christian and they're quoting Charles Spurgeon, well, God has already picked certain people to go to heaven. That's wicked doctrine. That's the kind of doctrine that keeps you from opening your mouth. Well, why should I tell them? Either God will pick them or not. Well, God, if God draws them, maybe they can be saying, hey, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Now, it's our job to tell them that. Don't you know he's already died for your sins? Don't you want to apply it to your account? John Calvin, most famous, right? Oh, yeah. God preordained. What's he saying? God already picked a part of the human race, only certain ones, a part of the human race, to eternal salvation. He, are, he only picked a certain part for salvation, and another part, he goes on, he says, to eternal damnation. Can you imagine a God and I have three children in my family, what I was raised in, right? Two brothers and a sister. Can you imagine a God that before any of the three of us were born, God looked and said, oh, well, Adam's going to heaven. But his brother, his sister, I have decided they won't even get a chance to have mercy. Man, how wicked is that? Wouldn't that cause you to just have a bitter attitude toward God? If that doctrine was projected upon you because of your sin, oh, well, I see your sin. You must be predetermined and predestined for hell. There's nothing you can do to get mercy from God. Wouldn't that just grieve your heart? Yeah, it would. Wouldn't that wear you out? Wouldn't that just be such a curse put on somebody? Thank God for the truth of the gospel. It's a free gift for everyone. Once you have it, you have it forever. We have those little pocket New Testaments up there. That's not one. We have some of those pocket New Testaments out. Those are the nice ones. They have the Psalms and the Proverbs. I already bought them for you. They're free. All you have to do is reach and take it, and it's yours forever. It's a picture of salvation. Yeah. I can't force it on you. I can't sneak one in your car and be like, ha-ha, I got one. I can't make you accept it. It's your choice. Salvation is the same way. I want to give you another quote. I'm actually going to give you two quotes by this guy. A.W. Pink is his name. Famously, he wrote a book, um, uh, The Sovereignty of God. And he wrote this after uh, being a Christian for a year. He was a Christian while growing up. He went into the Theosophical Society. Does anybody know what that is? The Theosophical Society is a satanic order that's very similar to uh, some of the Hinduism and the Eastern Indian religions. Um, I mean, it's, it's an occult. I don't want to give a bunch of graphic detail, but they're perverts. It's an occult. He traveled the country as a speaker and an author teaching their fatalistic doctrine, teaching strange doctrines. Well, then uh, he has a conversion moment, and a year later, all of a sudden, he's writing a book about how God is sovereign and you can't choose to be saved. Let me give you a couple of his quotes. He says, Man is unable to realize his own aspirations and materialize his own ideas. You can't even understand your own ideas. You can't come up with your own thought. Doesn't that go against what Psalms and Proverbs says? Doesn't God give us that ability? We are operating in the realm of what God has given us, mind you. I'm not taking away from the glory of God. In fact, to glorify God, what do we do? We choose to preach the gospel. We bear much fruit. It's all about our choices. Another pink quote. We do not preach the gospel because we believe that men are free moral agents and therefore capable of receiving Christ, but we preach it because we are commanded to do so. I am a robot. You can't understand what I'm saying. I just said it because God made me say it. You can't choose to believe it. It's not your faith. God forces it on you. Listen, Calvinism, as you often know, uh, teaches that you are regenerated, you are born again before you ever hear the gospel. 
God picked you and you're already elect, you're already in heaven, there's nothing you can do about it. It is bad doctrine, it's strange. And I, I want to show you this in Matthew 9. This is what we're going to look at this morning because this is a fact. Your faith saves you. You can trust in God. It's your choice. In fact, if you choose not to trust in God, if you doubt the promises of God, then you're yet in your sins. You're not saved. I want to read you uh, a, a list of verses where it's very clear that it is your faith that saves you, right? So bear with me one second. Uh, Matthew 9, we read it a minute ago. He says, uh, according to your faith, be it unto you. Luke 8, and he said unto them, where is your faith? The word to Jesus. Romans 1, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. 1 Corinthians 2, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain and your faith is also in vain. It's your choice to believe in the resurrection. If it didn't happen, boy, it's vain. What's your faith in? That's your choice. 1 Corinthians 15, he also says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and you're yet in your sins. 2 Corinthians 1, Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but our helpers. 2 Corinthians 10, Having hope when your faith is increased. Guess what? Now that you're saved, increase your faith. Add to your faith. Grow your faith. Ephesians 1, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Philippians 2, the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Colossians 1, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all saints. Colossians 2, the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Are you beginning to see a pattern here? It's up to you. It's up to you. I don't want you to get this fatalistic idea that you have no say in your life or in your future. And listen, God is sovereign. Amen. What do you mean by that? He is the king. And listen, if the king wants to put a red light to save your life, Lord, thank you for the red light. If he wants to give you a flat tire to save your life or a ticket, Lord, thank you for the ticket. Yeah. Listen, he knows what he's doing when we don't. He protects us. He puts, puts a hedge of protection around us. And look, he'll give you the money for the ticket. Don't worry about that. He will provide for us. He'll give us what we need. But it's our faith to act and make these choices that He blesses. There are greater blessings to come when we choose to exercise our own personal faith. 1 Thessalonians 1. For from you sounded out the world, I'm sorry, from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to God word is spread about. It's your faith toward God that matters. 1 Thessalonians 3, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and comfort you concerning your faith. I'm going to help establish you and keep moving you in the right direction. 1 Thessalonians 3, again, he says, For this cause, when I can no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. He says, I hear all these bad things coming from you. I hear bad doctrine. Now I'm here to find out what your faith is actually in. Is it in the right thing? Is it in the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm. He says, uh, brought us good tidings of your faith and charity. 2 Thessalonians 1, that your faith groweth exceedingly. Now, listen, you have a little bit of faith. You grow on it. You grow on it. It gets bigger. It increases. You add to it. This is the Christian life. The problem is sometimes it takes, you think, about, you think about a piece of bread, you stick it in, right? Well, it takes some heat for it to grow, right? Yeah. Sometimes we have to go through hard times, through pressure of life, before we really have faith increase in our life. And we add to our faith and get more gifts in life. James 1, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. It's the trying of your faith that helps you to grow. 1 Peter 1, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, 1 Peter 1 again, he says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Same chapter, he says that your faith and hope might be in God. 2 Peter chapter 1, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And of course, he goes on into virtue, knowledge. Add to your faith. You started with that foundation of faith. Now it's time for you to add to it. I want to show you four places here in Matthew chapter 9 where we see that their personal faith matters. 
And I want to apply, I want you to apply it to your life. I want you to see how downtrodden these people are, how hurting they are, and yet they have great confidence in the Lord to deliver. I want you to remember that your choices matter, and it's important for us to ask in confidence of God. We'll see these four stories. Uh, again, personal faith, how it helps move God to help you. First, we'll see the sick of the palsy. Look at verse number one. Yep. Matthew 9, verse number one. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came unto his own city. And behold, they brought unto him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. I love this. The sick is with his friends, and Jesus sees the sick man's faith, and he sees his friend's faith as they come to Jesus in confidence. Do you know how hard it is to move somebody that's sick of the palsy? Have you thought through the logistics of getting a friend that's sick in bed and can't get up and bring them by hand to someone? Think about what they've done. Jesus sees their faith. He sees their actions. Amen. That's obvious in the outward. But he sees their confidence. He sees that look. When they look at Jesus like this is the only hope we have, he sees their faith and he says, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. With confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. What a great, what a great blessing there. Verse 3 he says, And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Whether think ye evil in your hearts, for whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. You understand that salvation was the greater gift? And he gave him the ability to walk again. What a miracle. What power. Through the Son of Man, Jesus said, I want you to know the Son of Man, this flesh you're seeing, is God, and I have the power to forgive sins on earth. Only God can do that. We should have great confidence and faith in God. Our faith in God saves our soul because he's already offered the free gift. Jump ahead to verse number 18. We're going to see the ruler's daughter that had died. Verse number 18. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Now that's confidence. Yeah, it is. Yep. Hey, man, I'm having vehicle problems. Brother Doug, can you just come over? If you'll just lay your hand on the hood, it'll start right up. I know it will. Now that's confidence. Think about what he's saying. My daughter is dead. I'm here to see you. I know you can but touch her, and she'll come back to life. Yep. That's faith. That is strong confidence. Verse 19, And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did the disciples. Now, he's, as he's on the way, he heals the woman uh, diseased with blood. We'll come back to that. So skip ahead to verse 23. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and said unto the minstrels, those are the musicians, and the people making noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. He says, no, she's just sleeping. She's not dead. And of course, they laugh at him. They mock him. Verse 25. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. All he had to do was take her by the hand. Isn't that exactly what that man's faith was? Yep. All you have to do is touch her. And he says, okay, that's what I'll do. I'll touch her. And she came alive. And the fame thereof went abroad into all the land. We skipped over this. Let's go back. We're going to look at this blood-diseased woman. Same kind of faith and confidence in the Lord. Look at verse 20. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Listen, I don't know what problems you're having this morning, but I imagine they haven't been lasting for 12 years. She had great faith. I don't even have to ask for help. All I have to do is touch his garment. I don't even have to touch his hand. It's not that his hands are holy. It's not that his head is holy. It's that he is God and he has such power. If I can just touch the, uh, uh, the, bit, the, the thread, if I can get the bottom of his garment, mm -hmm. this 12-year disease is gone. Now that's confidence. Yeah, that is. And she gets what she believes. Look at verse 21. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus Turn him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. From the moment she touched, she received the healing by her own faith. He said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. 
Listen, forget fatalism. Forget Calvinism. Forget these strange doctrines that say, well, you, you can't change God's mind. No, God is asking you to ask Him for help and He'll answer. Yeah. Do you want mercy from God? Ask Him. Believe it. Have confidence in Him. He says, thy faith hath made thee whole. Let's look at the two blind men. Matthew 27, 9, verse 27. Oh, by the way, I love that how he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Same concept. Twelve years, be of good comfort. The man sick of the palsy, be of good cheer. Look at verse 27. And Jesus departed thence. Two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Well, you can't just ask God for mercy. He's already decided who gets mercy. No, they asked, believing and they received because of it. Verse 28, And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that, that no man know it. I love it. According, I'm sorry, I skipped verse 29, didn't he? Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. That's where I started, and that's where I'm ending. I just want you to know this, according to your faith, be it unto you. I know you're going through things in life, so am I. I say it all the time, life is a roller coaster. And it's not until the whole family is sick and you can't come to church, you say, man, I must be down in that valley right now. It's not until things get squirrely at work or maybe you have problems in your relationship, you start saying, Lord, what's going on here? Maybe sometimes God allows those things so you'll get on your knees and pray to Him, having great confidence that He can answer. Listen, we are not promised a great life here on earth. No. We are spoiled as Americans and as Christians, are we not? Yeah, we are. You know, I go to the fridge and I've got a clean glass and I put cold ice in it and I get a cold drink and all my food stays cold and the temperature, boy, it's just right. And I can step outside and jump in a vehicle and go wherever I want, as far as I want, as long as I want. I have a lot of freedom. Yeah. They didn't have those leisures back then. And I think sometimes those things blind us and deceive us. We ought to become so disciplined that we don't let the cares of this world and the pleasures of this life distract us. Yeah, but you know, I do need a new car. Well, okay. You know there's people without a car. You know there's families of seven fitting in a small little car that have a lot more room than I have. We need to stop and reconsider. Listen, we, we preach against materialism, but we're also kind of deceived by it and blinded by it. These two blind men that had literally nothing, do you think they were great property owners? Mm. They're probably beggars. Yeah. They came to Jesus with great confidence. Believe ye that I am able to do this? Yea, Lord. According to your faith be it unto you. I love what he says next. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, now think about this. This is the first time they see. According to your faith be it unto you. Boom, their eyes open. The first thing Jesus says unto them, see. What? Look at it. See that no man know it. Boy, that's kind of hard. Did they obey Jesus here? They disobeyed. How can you disobey God? He says, see that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad the fame in all this country. They became evangelists. They had no sight. They had no possessions. They had nothing in life. They were just being led by the hand by strangers and fed by strangers by the mercy and compassion of other people. And Jesus right away, he gives them sight and he says, see that no man know it. They said, no, we're, now that we can see, every man will know it. We're going to proclaim that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins and to heal the lame. Their faith in God gave them sight and they became great evangelists for the Lord. Look at verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Listen to this, verse 37. Yes. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. There's a lot of people out there that want the blessing from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people out there that would be saved if they could just hear it. Well, why are the laborers are few? Is it because God doesn't want anybody saved? God doesn't want anybody in heaven? There's only so much room? Listen, Calvinism, fatalism is strange, wicked doctrine. Or is it maybe because... Those that have the gift choose not to share it. They choose to not open their mouth. 
Maybe they don't want to obey their father and go into the vineyard today and bring forth some harvest. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Jesus said to his disciples, you guys, pray for more disciples. We need more help. If I had more of you, we could do more. Jesus picked 12 and taught them. Then he says, go ye and do thou likewise. You, now you 12, go get 12. And then those 12 get another 12. According to your faith be it unto you. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Listen, it is personal faith that saves your soul. And it's personal faith that will bless your ministry in this life and bless your life in this life. We must have great confidence in God. He will provide. Believe me, we, we should have great trust in things that we can't see. Blind faith, call it whatever you want. But listen, don't be a fatalist. Don't say, well, there's nothing I can do to change it. Then why is he saying that we should pray? Can't he just send more? Yeah, but he asked us to pray for more, didn't he? That's what we're praying as a church. Lord, send some more laborers into your harvest so you can get the glory as we get more souls saved and on fire and choosing to follow you. It's our job to make some disciples, isn't it? John 15, 18, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. It's our choice to bear fruit. It's our choice to preach the gospel. It is your faith that saves you. You can trust God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing that you've taught us here. Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply it and remember it and share this and just, just give us the, the... Lord, help us to have the desire to know when to open our mouth. Lord, give us a burden for our area, for our extended family, for our workers, Lord, I just our, our co-workers and everybody that we come across. Lord, I pray that you would send more laborers into your harvest in Jacksonville, Florida, and we trust you to answer that prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.